the session i would like to invite the session chair uh, dr s sashi and kaushal kishore to proceed okay uh, good afternoon everyone so let us start with the session on industry problem and uh, academic solutions so the sponsor for this uh, first uh, presentation is silver sponsor imta as part of that i would request dr dasharth ram yadav ex director of drdl hyderabad to deliver his talk on indian defense and aerospace sector drdo initiative okay he is to okay uh, silver sponsor imta so they will uh, make the first presentation sorry uh, for the first 10 minutes good afternoon all of you uh, thank you for uh, you know giving us an opportunity to be part of this uh, august uh, you know gathering and event uh, much appreciated so we represent uh, indian manufacturing uh, tool uh, machine tool manufacturers association imtma the association itself is uh, more than uh, 76 77 years old uh, so uh, along with the other activities of any association we have a training wing okay so where we try to bridge the skill gap uh, what is required by the industry and the student community so i have a small presentation here uh, which is a video i want to play it for you after that uh, you know we have a testing facility also machine tool testing facility we would like to talk about that thank you the indian machine tool manufacturers association imtma providing the cutting edge to india's machine tool industry IMTMA was formed in 1946 with a vision of providing a one-stop impetus for the machine tool industry in India, spearheading India into the forefront of industrial revolution by providing a platform for symbiotic industry growth and innovation-led machine tool technologies. What's more, IMTMA has today become a center of excellence for focused application-based training. training and skill development at IMTMA Early on IMTMA recognized the need in the industry for skilled enabled manpower The technology center was established in 2009 for imparting practical training for industry professionals as well as students completing their engineering education Over 40,000 resources have been trained in the pristine state of the art technology center that is equipped with truly state of the art CNC machines, CMM and metrology equipment, industrial automation elements, robots and an advanced CAD lab. Finishing school in production engineering. One of the major challenges faced by the manufacturing industry is availability of trained manpower. So this is because the students coming out of educational institutions lack the practical skills in the fundamentals of manufacturing in order to address this gap imgme is organizing a hands on course namely finishing school in production engineering for importing practical oriented training for the fresh mechanical engineers passing out of the institutions in all the aspects of modern manufacturing with hands on inputs in cnc machines and other accessories this course enables the students to pursue their career in manufacturing industries in various functions including sales marketing design engineering production quality service and application and other divisions Students have the opportunity to get absorbed by various manufacturing industries considering their strong fundamental knowledge and practical abilities. Foundation course in industrial automation. Today, entire manufacturing industry is focusing on automation and moving towards smart manufacturing, industry 4.0, industrial internet of things. In this regard, IMTMA Technology Center is equipped with the necessary industrial automation elements including hydraulics and pneumatics sensors PLC servo 
VFD, HMI and Robotics. As a first step towards Industry 4.0, IMTMA is organizing a foundation course in industrial automation in order to prepare the engineers in industrial automation with hands-on training in these equipment. Design Institute Machine design is a very important and complex process which led to success and failure of any manufacturing industry. IMTMA Design Institute has structured and developed a very comprehensive program on machine tool design for such aspiring engineers to make them industry ready. This intensive program develops the capability and confidence in engineering basics, kinematics of machines, principles of making manufacturing drawings, CAD skills, conceptualization skills, design for manufacturing and assembly aspects, engineering calculations, engineering materials and heat treatment, GDNT and product validation through analytical and as well FEA approach. The IMTMA Training Advantage The IMTMA courses are differentiated by the comprehensive hands-on experience that the students receive on the latest machines that are in current use in leading organizations across the world. The finishing school the automation course and design course are supported by practical training on CNC machines and other equipment, giving the students a direct edge over the average theory-based engineering applicants. Engineering students gain confidence in their skills and prospective roles and gain campus advantage to the powerful member organizations who are part of the IMTMA network. This finishing school program uh, helped me a lot to understand the industry standards. It gave me an exposure to the industry and it boosted my confidence level in finding better employability. As I wanted to be a design engineer, I joined this uh, finishing school program to enhance my technical skills on CNC machines, programming and quality control. As the name suggests, finishing school program is a one-stop solution for all the freshly graduate engineering students to enhance their technical skills and knowledge. Short-term workshops for industry professionals. We conduct many short-term programs at IMTMA for working professionals. We organize such workshops, more than 80 technical topics covering the various functions of the manufacturing industries, uh, including R&D, productions, planning, quality and maintenance. Each of these programs are delivered by the subject matter expert having more than 30 years of experience in the particular domains. Classroom sessions are supported by practicals, demonstration and industry visit in order to make the learning complete. IMTMA has taken great strides in its vision for a unified, progressive machine tool industry in India. IMTMA continues to provide next generation training and skill development to young engineering minds who will go on to reshape the Indian industrial landscape as we know it. Uh, just to add to this, uh, the technology center that was referred to in this video, these are all short and hour uh, no, training center. We have one in Bangalore and one in Pune. Uh, currently, we are setting up one in Gurgaon to take care of all the skill requirements of North region. That will be completed in another six months time. Now, I want to briefly introduce the testing facilities that we have for machine tools. I invite Madan, who is my colleague. Yeah, this is Madan from uh, AMTTF. We are Advanced yeah, Machine Tool Testing Facility. So, we are a part of IMTMA. So, we are a testing wing, technical wing of IMTMA where we <coughs> provide testing services to various engineering products and especially in machine tools. So, for that, even as uh, previous uh, uh, speaker, Mr. Nirasinghasar sir uh, told uh, that uh, NGPG machine, precision machine and those 11 projects sponsored by MHI for IIT Madras, all those machines and products are we are the testing partner for those products. So, we test the machines and uh, uh, with the benchmark uh, machine of uh, imported machine and we qualify the project. And these uh, just a small 30 seconds uh, video also I just want to uh, show you about what all the facilities we have in our office. <laughs>
that was a brief introduction about ourselves. Uh, so, if there are any questions, I would like to take it. Otherwise, we have left, uh, you know, some information on, on the seats. So, I request people to collect it and then read it and in leisure and then if you have any doubts or clarifications, please reach out to us. Yeah, so the IMTMA as such has got many verticals, you know, one of that is our uh, exhibitions, we conduct world class exhibitions. We also, uh, you know, have a, a campus which is, uh, you know, built for exhibitions, around 60 acres of campus is available, uh, state, of the art, uh, state of the art world class exhibition centers are there. We do two uh, exhibitions, uh, primarily IMTEX uh, cutting and IMTEX forming, which is done once in two years. So, there is also an invite, January we are having an IMTEX forming, I have left that invitation also in that, uh, you know, uh, material. So, I request all of you to attend that, because that is where you get to meet a lot of uh, industry people and uh, Academia Pavilion also we have. So, I am requesting that if somebody wants to take part in the Academy Pavilion, then write to us. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Now, uh, the momento will be delivered. So, I request the next presenter, Dr. Das Dasrat Ram Yadav from, uh, who is the ex-director of DRDL Hyderabad. He will give his talk on Indian Defense and Aerospace Sector, DRDO Initiative, Industry, uh, Industry Academia Interaction. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I am uh, going to cover uh, basically what type of uh, initiative we are taken. Uh, I think my work has been, become little bit easier as an introduction part. What uh, Dr. Niraj Sinha has told. So, taking that as an input and in the DRDO, what are the opportunities has been created uh, to the industry and academia interaction and uh, what uh, further work we are doing, I am going to explain some of them. This, I uh, will be not uh, talking much because time is very limited. So, you know everywhere uh, as far as defense is concerned, it is uh, uh, really tough as such for any industry to develop all the expertise uh, in-house and uh, uh, it has have a small batch size, lot of, uh, you need the resources and uh, different technology requirements are there. So, it faces uh, very good challenges as such. If uh, you see, uh, as far as that uh, defense R&D and uh, industrial growth, uh, uh, if you take in 1950, it was almost nil. And uh, most of the R&D and I can say that product specific R&D started uh, when we had taken the uh, our uh, uh, missiles programs. Basically, at that time, it was sanctioned in 1980 and 90s where all the IGMDP program, where Agni, Prithvi, Trisul, Nag and uh, Akas, uh, all the projects got sanctioned and we started uh, working on the main battle tank actually. And uh, by the time 1988 and 89, you know that Pokhran test happened and as far as that foreign collaboration, everything uh, totally stopped as such. And uh, that gave a lot of uh, thrust in the Indian industry because I still remember for buying a machine to HMT, we have to wait, uh, give the order and wait years together to get that one. And uh, foreign country, nothing was available and uh, in-house so many programs you cannot do. So, lot of, uh, you can say, industry uh, grooming has happened around Hyderabad. Now, what are the people are... Uh, there now all those things are groomed by part of DRDO and these all these programs. If you see the DRDO means uh, diverse area where we do the aeronautics because DRDO if you see as a uh, organization it is uh, nearly seven clusters are there where in the aeronautics uh, we do all the aircraft and uh, UAV and other things are there, electronics all the radars comes we work in the life sciences also 
and then uh, all the electronics are there and basic uh, major where you can say armament and convect uh, engineering where all the tanks and other uh, development has taking place of course uh, we make the missile where tactical and strategic missiles are also part of that if you see the drdo because a lot of things doesn't come in the open source uh, so we do lot of projects uh, which is visible where uh, directly it goes and deploy in services lot of projects uh, where uh, we can say it is a very specific in the nature where uh, we can say strategic projects are there where we make and we ourselves deploy that one and we take care of that of course with the help of services and a lot of projects and other things what you are saying in the public domain of course we work with that then now you can say if any country want to become a strong either technically or militarily or anything you should have a very strong uh, defense base backbone sort of things should be there and uh, until up till uh, if you brought in all the industry and all it is very difficult to gather because single uh, person supply chain and all it cannot be done Uh, if you see the drdo what we did we because more or less uh, we had started 1988 it was zero base actually uh, as far as industry is concerned and uh, mostly drdo and uh, ajan today so many msc has been developed and uh, now we had parted all these technologies like uh, development of process technology product what are the quality standards are there what are the infrastructure facility we had developed and same thing we had open to them for the private industry also basically testing and qualification area if you see as and today now major uh, you can say stakeholder of uh, mod is there ardens factory now they had uh, restructured and defense psu are there uh, and uh, of course services are there taking all these requirements and uh, then as and today you can say academy and nearly 100 academy uh, more than 100 are uh, involved in this uh, drdo activities industry if you can say it is beyond 2000 or something like that and a uh, lot of uh, basic research are done by science and a uh, uh, lot of uh, basic research laboratories is there and of course uh, the way you are seen the uh, niti ayog like this so many military uh, think tanks are there where they make the policy and uh, in the process we have to work in the futuristic area for all those things this is the actually if you see lot of policy decision has been taken uh, to help the industry actually uh, now earlier it used to be there ki lot of uh, it will be open tender now it has been restricted if it technology can be done in house it should not go as such outside up to 200 crore order will not go with the global tender so all these things the government has facilitated with said and uh, lot of technology drdo has transferred to the industry and uh, industry working in drdo facilities with their scientists it is they are being trained actually A limited series production uh, drdo is helping that and uh, science uh, scientists providing input for productionization where all the nitty gritty and you can say what are technology we have developed it is open to all the people if you see development of technology wise if suppose i try to just uh, name few of them these are the basic uh, critical things where uh, you can say lot of material requirement if you see as and today what is there when we are working in the hypersonic uh, domain is totally different as such so if you develop the material how to shape and size and being in the aerospace uh, because most of the missile you might have seen uh, they are cylindrical in the shape but futuristic missiles they are like aircraft flying vehicle actually then uh, what are the composite material uh, that sort of things how to engineer unmanned flight vehicle on board computers mission software phase array radars uh, mi rv technology so all these things are uh, totally different uh, technology all together if you see reentry technology uh, inertial guidance uh, it is like a missile is not a one technology it is a mix up uh, so many things are there together to succeed actually and if you see the technology and future programs uh, already has been identified you can uh, see this uh, each area what are the uh, what are the 
critical technology if you see what are we are going to do in the future already identified missiles what we are going to do and which are the critical technology where we need support from the r and d and the institutes same way in the electronics material uh, aeronautics armaments life sciences everywhere it is already identified what are technology we are looking for future basically just i wanted to give two successful program where we had a joint venture between uh, brahmos uh, as far as that uh, uh, missile and uh, total weapon system is concerned where uh, india is a major partner 51 and 49% they are there and this is the we had started with the partnership with that and uh, aim was there we will develop the technology as we are progressing and uh, uh they will allow us to develop those technology and i am very happy to say as on today 80% of all the brahmos missiles are done in india and uh, major uh, components are coming from your uh, lnt and uh, godrej who, who are the major uh, number where uh, we used to do now they are making hundreds of the canister in a year actually and which uh, we are not able to make even 3 or 4 it took a lot of time but those type of technologies are being developed and uh, we we had succeeded with that then uh, when we went to the second uh, joint venture where we told now we are developed the propulsion technology and uh, only front end where you can say seeker and all those technologies are not there and uh, this was also like uh, uh, lr some projects uh, uh, it is a joint venture with israelis it was very successful where total front end front uh, back end was done by even propulsion servo and uh, actuators everything was done in india front end was uh, only coming from their seeker and uh, some of the control system with that now bdl is uh, become the lead integrator and uh, in the condition was there ki will be further development will be doing and they will be outsourcing all those things from indian industry now <laughs> those uh, industry we were part of that there we groomed quality we had changed now they had become the supplier for the israel actually and uh, now full time production is being done by them of course uh, our own production we, being, is also is being taken care of that the this is the now what are the things uh, we are going to do now government has taken lot of initiative where make one two make two make three category where uh, drdo will be not working industry and the services together they can do and they can come and test at our place and what are the of course when we are looking for a 5 trillion uh, economy major uh, until up till we do the export of the uh, from from the defense sector we will be not able to achieve now we had achieved more or less uh, 30 uh, means 25000 crore now aim is there next year uh, we should be able to go to 40000 crore of export and already product has been added. this is the major project and program you can see which has been already sanctioned by government and uh, good part is there this uh, all are uh, going to be done most of 90% are uh, hardware is being being done in india itself where where joint venture is there they are also they are being forced to bring it and work it here so that is a very good initiative and these are the uh, you can say nearly 175000 crore of worth of hardware already in the queue where all the most of our dpsu and a uh, few of the private industry are already in the partner in that and DRDO has brought a concept where uh, when we call DCPP, it is development comes production order. The government initiative is there. Uh, your R&D unit will be part of the development. And uh, as soon as it is over, uh, production will go to them. So we are in five in advance. We work with them. And once product is proven out, they will start doing the production. Now this is the sum of the... Uh, I can say weapon system already identified which government has opened key it is open for uh, export and you might be heard about Armenia or, uh, and a uh, lot of African countries uh, and uh, Philippines and all anyway they are uh, selling the Brahmos. Eh? So, so many things are happening as far as the export is concerned. Now coming to the main theme of that uh, what we have done actually we had identified the technology where is the if you see the any system where uh, at least basic research have we done with that uh, technology have to 
we develop technology have to go in the product and product again have to be uh, tailor made to the industrial use and all so now already some of the production already is being done some of the technology is available we had identified for the future requirement where <coughs> technology readiness level is very less where we are looking help from the industry and uh, once it grows in the basic research we want uh, industry should come academia should come in the first level second level uh, industry should come third level of course uh, industry should come uh, uh, and we will be doing the hand holding and where we have to increase the this technology this is the one uh, slide i wanted to show it is a basically uh, international development agency that is model they had shown where in the center you can see it is a science and technology and uh, manufacturing plays a major role in this how to reduce the cost same thing can until up till you are competitive you will be having process the once you are doing the new material uh, you, you you need uh, different new and uh, different technology with the the basically you can see this is the triangle and uh, this sci science and technology is the core in that area and these two island uh, uh, with that only you will be able to do the advanced product the, that is the in the theme now we had started working for the audio this uh, i am just quitting fast the now this is the new engagement model what we have thought where uh, universities are coming in the and uh, regional institute university will be coming in that uh, first level where they will be doing the basic research and uh, uh, research and innovation what is trying to do drdo will be the uh, more or less uh, input taking from the services user requirement uh, doing the design of that one and uh, with this basic things uh, developing this technology and uh, then industry comes in the picture and of course some international collaboration will be there uh, and uh, we are expecting we should have a very strong bond uh, as far as that uh, between all the three adequate financing should be there facility uh, easy to migration uh, of the people first aid to migration of people thinking and uh, domain knowledge and establish the facility now i i, I am just uh, trying to bring it out a few of the initiative what drdo has done this is a defense india startup challenge it is the ministry of defense uh, and uh, i think it is a year, yearly they are given a uh, uh, few of the area where uh, it is required for ministry of defense it is a given list by services uh, which will be part of a research and development prototyping pilot implementation market assessment if you put up that proposal it is being assessed by committee and uh, funding is being done where you can be take the help from the outside agency you can take from institute and institutes also uh, you can say who can apply startup they can people can apply with that msc can do individual including institute innovators are also encouraged to apply in this scheme other is tdf this is a drdo funded program where already uh, services has identified what is the core area is there drdo has given on the website list you can identify with that one and uh, uh, out of that uh, you just you can come up in these things uh, what you are going to develop it is a very short duration two years if you are able to develop some technology earlier it was 10 crore it is 50 crore funding can be given the, this is the drdo uh, uh, has taken initiative and different options are there and uh, uh, in, in this you can say proprietor partnership uh, private industry uh, anyone who are there but at the end of the product uh, have to be given by them and uh, this is funding is there in the i can say different stages but uh, if you uh, it can be done one go also only thing they may be looking from bank guarantee now that uh, coming to that uh, now drdo has come up uh, with the, the seeing all these things we had opened nearly 15 uh, center of excellence in the uh, 15 center of excellence in the iits and uh, um, uh, most of the indian institutes of science we had opened and uh, this criteria of uh, 
selecting this center of excellence uh, has been taken uh, care of what is the DRDO future requirement is there. Second thing is there which are the laboratory surrounding who are going to use this one. And in this what we had done, uh, we had uh, opened a direct center there and uh, they, there is no key in the year only once or twice or thrice what you can do. You, 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 uh, once you identify ki this is your core competence, you, you can go to, uh, there uh, already one residence uh, director will be there uh, and the office is there, you put up a proposal. And uh, based on that review, sanction will come immediately. And uh, that uh, center head, uh, he is supposed to uh, do all uh, groundwork and uh, only things is there that technology should be available and sub laboratories should tell that I am going to use. one more minute. Okay. One so, more minute. Okay. So I, I think I will be not talking too much on this because uh, I think my colleagues uh, will be talking on that. What is the role of that? So... Uh, only things I wanted to say, <coughs> one example I was giving because I was involved in the Center of Excellence in IIT Hyderabad. Uh, you can see this is a five, uh, six technology has been identified that they will be working on this area. And uh, uh, this is the out of that I can tell you that one product has come that is 3D printing of uh, large size combustion engine. We had funded nearly 10 crore to them and uh, that machine is already has been uh, developed and it is a trial to where total combustion engine in one go we can print. It is a maybe India largest side machine. Uh, it is three meter of uh, height and one meter by one meter uh, diameter and uh, I, I can say within that it can do it. So with these uh, things uh, only uh, issue is there. Uh, uh, with this, we are uh, trying to bring all the academia and shoot and uh, uh, opening the center of excellence idea is there. If somebody is uh, full time there, only things you approach and uh, he will coordinate and try to help it out. The seeing all these things, uh, I had other transparency, what will happen with that, but uh, because time is not there, but we want to transform DRDO as a dynamic organization where we should take help from the industry, we can take from them. Because earlier our project cycle used to be there 5 years, 10 years. Now within 3 years we have to deployment is there. So within that, uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to me. If any further question, uh, certainly I will prefer to reply. Maybe we can discuss during lunch, sir. Because in the interest of time, we will uh, move to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, maybe if any questions are there, people can discuss over lunch. Uh, now, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, interesting talk and uh, providing a lot of information. Uh, now I would uh, request the next speaker from uh, Delightcom or uh, Gold Sponsor to come and give their presentation. So you have 10 minutes. Kindly stick to the time. Good morning. How can I be of use? So when I was told to uh, come and speak over here, this was the first question that came to my mind. Ki, there are so many delegates and so many experts in their own fields. How can I be of use? And this is not the first time that I asked this question. So, uh, I'm a third generation entrepreneur and uh, I've been blessed to be born in a family uh, who have been leaders and uh, changers in the industry. So I went to the furniture industry and in 1970s, 1980s, jo Elmira hoti thi, wo jo paint hoti thi, wo brush se ya jo uh, fabric hota tha, usse paint hoti thi. And at that time, my grandfather shifted the whole norm, shifted the whole industry and changed it to, changed it to a spray, ke, spray paint kind of a uh, painting system. After that, a few years later, they again shifted and changed it, changed the industry from a spray paint kind of a system to an oven dried uh, spray paint kind of a system. Then in 1990s, when my chacha and my father uh, joined the business, they again transformed the whole furniture industry and we were one of the first 
in India to transform uh, a spray paint kind of a manufacturing uh, painting system to a uh, conveyorized powder coating unit. We were the first in the furniture industry, and and we and everyone followed the suit after that. And again, uh, we shifted from a manual based, tool based manufacturing to a NC machine, automa semi automated machinery. Again, uh, during that period, uh, we were the first to introduce the panel based workstations and uh, compactor storages. But, uh, and, and the, and the uh, products that we created at that time are the same products that are being used by the whole industry right now. And then I joined the business. And when I joined the business, I thought and I, I figured out that only the product cannot be the leader or cannot be the changing, uh, changing factor in the industry at this time. Who remembers this? This is an Apple's AirPod which was launched in 2016 by Apple. And it was first of its kind in the industry and it changed the industry. But within nine months, there were 50 different models of by different manufacturers and different competitors that were doing more or less the similar kind of a thing. Sure, there was a difference in technology, there was a difference in quality, but the, the underlying solution that the, the problem it was solving was the same. So we understood that the product cannot be the main product. Then what? Then I thought, how can be I of use? And we brainstormed and we found that the basic of inclusive manufacturing industry 5.0 has to be that the technology and the improvements need to be people focused and needs to be driven by values. So we went on a journey. I interacted and, under, uh, and understood the customers. We interacted with directors, uh, head of departments, professors, students and what came out boiled down to three things which will be explained further by Lokshri. So after our interactions with our customers, the first thing that we found out was that we shouldn't just be a furniture supplier, but be a solution provider. So uh, we were talking to, our, uh, to people uh, and we met with uh, Dr. Uh, Rahul and he told us that he has a requirement for lab furniture. Upon talking to him, we actually understood that it's not just a lab furniture that he requires, but he's looking for a creative environment in which he can teach his students. So we recommended him that he should not only focus on the number of students that he's catering to right now, but also look at the future that in five years, more students might come in. So we provided a complete solution for that. The second thing that we got to know from our customers was that they don't want any chick chick and they want timely order execution and even after execution, they don't want any chick chick from their suppliers. So basically by chick chick here, I mean that they don't want to go through like regular follow ups. They don't want to go back and forth with the vendor and uh, themselves. And we, we understand that, you know, the brightest minds of India are present in these prestigious institutions. So we also don't want them to waste their time in these regular chick chicks. And we believe that if you start following up for everything, then who will do your work? So this is where we come in and we have world-class systems where you have complete transparency. You can see which, uh, which level your order is at and even after, uh, after getting your order, you will get everything on your uh, WhatsApp through notifications. The third thing we found out was that they just don't want to uh, talk about the product but go beyond it. And in furniture, uh, servicing is very important. Maintaining the product can last for a long time. Uh, I'll take an example of a mattress. Do you know that if a mattress is rotated once in every few months, it will uh, can last for more than three years as well. So we provide periodic maintenance depending on the type of the requirement for the furniture. It can be related to, you know, like lubrication or upgrading certain hardware. And we also understand that after sale service is important. So we have a framework in which we 
respond to every complaint within four hours. So these were some of our findings upon talking to our customers. And now I'd like to invite uh, Divyanshu again to explain how we are doing this in the real world. So imagine, a uh, new semester is starting and we are expecting 700 extra students from the last year. Rooms, and during the inspection it was found out that rooms hai, usme we cannot add new beds. And we have only 25 days left for new hostel rooms to be ready. And during that period we have to call for the sampling. We need to get the things finalized. We need to get the paperwork and budget approved from the communities. We need to place the order, the manufacturer has to manufacture the beds and everything has to be uh, delivered and installed within those 15 days. It seems like an impossible task to be done in, in such a short period of time. And, and most of the furniture manufacturers which, which uh, the industry talked to said no, it cannot be done. And imagine, on the, on the contrary, after, after the process of sample finalization, on the basis of verbal commitment and without a PO, a, a product or rather a solution worth more than 1.5 crores is delivered on a verbal commitment which includes 750 sets of beds, tables, chairs and almiras within, the twi within 20 days. It seems like a hypothetical situation but we are proud to say that we were able to provide this kind of a solution to our partners and in one of the IITs. So this is providing solution rather than a product, giving a hassle-free timely delivery and going beyond the product. This is our take on Industry 5.0, how we were able to do it, on a imp implement it on a practical level will be explained by uh, Mr. Varun Kukreja. He, he is a furniture specialist and author and he has an experience of more than 30 years in furniture industry and project management. Off to Mr. Varun. So how do we do it? Sir, you have one Sorry. minute. Final one minute. So how do we do it? To build it, uh, strong value is required in the company. Strong value is required at the root of the company to make it possible. So what are our values which help us to build this? First is gratitude. We are grateful for all the customers, all the employees of the company, all the vendors. Care. We take care of everybody. We take care of our customers, go out of the way to take care of them. We go out of the way to take care of our employees. We take care of our vendors. Continuous improvement. So we have a culture of improving every day. What I have improved today. So every day we ask this question and make some minor or major improvement every day. It is all built on honesty and integrity. If I am honest with myself, if I am honest to my job. And the customer is no longer the king, customer is the queen. How you serve the queen, the customer will take care of you. So now you have two choices. You can select any vendor who sells your product. Or you can find a solution provider who understands your requirement and has expertise in solution providing and works within your budget in mind. Uh, so we have circulated a form. If you can fill up that, we can have a one-to-one -one session for any requirement you have in future and we can suggest a possible solution. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, as a token of appreciation, we would like to present a memento. Thanks for your... Uh, Okay, so the next speaker is Dr. Tapash Kumar Nandi. So, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I think I am a little bit of a misfit in this, uh, in this uh, theme. Uh, being a, a metallurgist and amongst all mechanical engineers, but over a period of time I have felt that uh, there has to be a close interaction between mechanical engineers and and metallurgist and as a metallurgist when we do experiment we feel that you know we, we want our equipment to be perfect all instrumentation and you know all data recording and all that because 
anything that you do with whatever theoretical inputs that you have you have to iterate and if you want to iterate then you have to have perfect data in terms of process parameters and all that so that is where the role of mechanical engineers come and i have i've been in a research lab for about 30 years and and i've had close associations with mechanical engineers and together i can say that we have made uh, we have made you know a happy association so uh, before before i you know i discuss some of the specific problems this will be specific problems not macroscopic but microscopic problems that we have faced when we have tried to you know develop materials incidentally it was it was a challenging topic uh, given to me by dr santosh kumar but then i visited uh, my career in dmrl and you know decollected all the uh, challenges that we faced in material development at different stages so i tried to compile some of them but before i do that i think i will just give you a brief introduction about what dmrl does the dimes material research lab is basically you know we are involved in development of materials and and not just materials as, some, as someone pointed out before my presentation that we only not only provide materials but we also provide complete material solutions so that is our basic mandate and what we do is we develop advanced materials innovate on processing and then do related product engineering some of that will become clear in my talk so this these are our uh, core areas microstructure uh, property correlation uh, so we are uh, as metallurgists we are very comfortable with microstructure that is our starting point we look at the structure at different length scales and try to make predictions about properties so that is uh, uh, microstructure property correlation that is what we work on and once you know having that knowledge we work on development of special metals uh, special alloys steels intermetallics and as i said we also innovate on processes so as to improve properties we also have uh, we also have a department on surface engineering which is related to coating tribology and i have seen lot of tribological work um, being done in the mechanical department here so there is a, there there is a, uh, there is a strong basis for collaboration here because as a metallurgist we can all, we always uh, feel that we can bring something new to the work that um, goes on and of course the, the product engineering because at the end of the day we are uh, developing products or we are you know making semi finished products so all the related engineering work you know uh, you know trying to translate that whole thing to industry from a lab scale that is going to be a challenge you know how their ecosystem is different completely different from what we do at lab so how to adapt uh, you know how to adapt that ecosystem for a production of a component which is which satisfy users needs and uh, major contributions of dmrl we have been working for aerospace applications we are working for you know army and and of course uh, as dr dasharath ram showed that we also work uh, for some of the missile you know their material needs also we try to ad address latest being uh, the hypersonic uh, program there we are working for uh, development of high temperature materials we also do a lot of failure analysis and basically the requirement uh, mainly comes from aerospace and other defense units and based on our knowledge our detailed knowledge on characterization we uh, carry out detailed failure anal analysis and give them the root cause and that kind of builds uh, the credibility for the lab so any future alloy development or material development program they approach us with uh, confidence because we have uh, in past we have been able to solve some of their problems uh dmrl being a lab you, we we will not we cannot uh, we we can produce things at small scale right so when it comes to larger scale we have to go to industry or there have been some industries that have come because you know because of D, uh, the work that has been done at dmrl and okay. yeah so midhani midhani is one of them mrish dhatu nigam that is uh, industry that is next door and they have done a, uh, they have you know they are basically involved in the development of um, you know titanium alloys nickel based super alloys specialty steels and many of many of the alloys that they have developed over a period of time or which are productionized uh, the work has been done initially initial work has been done at lab scale at dmrl so we have a very close association with midani and uh, then uh, i think i'll probably if, if time permits i will 
uh, I'll talk about tungsten heavy alloy. So tungsten heavy alloy is another you know long rod product which has been uh, supplied to army. Uh, so for the production of tungsten heavy alloy, we you know there was another uh, organization that was developed in Tiruchirappalli, uh, HAPP heavy alloy penetrator project, which has now become high energy projectile factory. Then ARCI Advanced Research Center International again. Mm, uh, you know, came out from DMRL. So there are uh, you know number of organizations that has come out of the research efforts that has been put at DMRL. So uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Dasharam Dasharam showed that we have had interactions. So DMRL also is interacting with you know a lot of agencies. We interact with academia, IITs, and NITs for. Uh, so some of the work because all the work can probably cannot be done at uh, at lab level, especially the theoretical inputs. So that is where we take their help extensively. Then we also work with NML, you know, other sister, uh, you know, uh, CSIR organization. NML being one of them. A very recent example is we were involved in the extraction of tungsten, and uh, NML had the requisite expertise, so we approached them. And today we have uh, some of the flow sheets that are in place. Uh, recycling of uh, tungsten carbide to tungsten metal and also you know extracting tungsten from lean grade ores. So there we took help of CSIR lab. So we are closely interacting with them. As I said earlier that we have been interacting with a lot of industries, uh, Midhani, HEPF, uh, SAIL also in a major way because there, there was uh, in fact director DMR Dr. Bala Muli Krishna, he has been spearheading this activity and uh, you know, we have developed uh, different grades of naval steels, and that is where we were um, extensively involved with sail and other steel plants. <coughs> and of course, our sister organizations, sister organization, mainly because they are the users. As someone said, that you know, you do directed basic research. So yes, we do directed research, and our uh, research depends upon uh, the requirements that are put by. Uh, the sister labs. Uh, one of the, one example is GTRE, gas turbine research, uh, gas turbine development establishment, and they basically, you know, they require high temp uh, high temperature materials in form of nickel based super alloys, titanium uh, based alloys. So, so some of the work that we have done is primarily based on the requirement that have been, you know, put forth by these organizations. Okay, so this is just about our manpower. We have about 200 scientists, and you can see a significant fraction of them are PhDs. Uh, some of them are, are homegrown PhDs. They have they have done PhD while they were working, and of course, some of them have been recruited from outside. And we feel that this is the knowledge base that helps us in you know in developing any new material, or even if you want to indigenize a material, you require a sound knowledge base, and this is what helps us in designing. And developing new materials. Uh, just about me, I have been I have worked in titanium alloys for uh, uh, 20 years, and then and for last 14 to 15 years, I have worked in <coughs> tungsten heavy alloys. So basically, now I will come to uh, uh, some of the problems that we have faced. But before we do do that, maybe let's just go through this process, uh, flow sheet. So what? How do we develop a material? What we do is, as he said, is user driven. For example, GTRE wants a titanium uh, alloy for a, their compressor stage. The temperature of application is 600 degrees centigrade, let's say, and some strength and tree property. So that is that is where user comes into picture. And since it is an aerospace material, we need to do certification. So we involve them right uh, right away. And uh, what uh, the basic a simple flow sheet is: we will be carrying out melting, uh, vacuum arc melting, then processing it and evaluate. If we are not meeting the properties, which will certainly happen, we will go back, we will iterate, fine tune the composition and processing. And, and, and you know, this cycle continues till we achieve the properties at lab level. And once we do that, then we go for scale up at an industry and, and that is when the certification agency comes. A typical, uh, you know, a typical titanium alloy will uh, uh, you, know, you, you will require at least four two ton mills, four two ton mills, and they have to be processed. And extensive property evaluations need to be done. And there are uh, testing houses also. DMRL by itself cannot do the test. Midhani has some of their facilities. Then we also take help from external agencies. So 
so extensive property evaluation after four mills when all the properties are consistently met then it is ready for production so that is how it is once it is ready for production then we don't have all the detailed tests but we some have some release tests a limited number of tests but that have to be met that is what an aero you know aero um, aeronautical ala requires which means if you talk in terms of time frame then uh, i think each melt probably will take about a year to process so about four years so that is uh, four to five years that is what is required for developing an alloy for an aeronautical application so it can it just cannot come the next day so you one has to go through this extensive process to certify a new material <coughs> so just when we say that we have developed a material we have to be very careful because it has not undergone any sort of, you know we have only developed it at lab scale but the next challenge that is to certify it is is much bigger than that with this uh, probably i will now come to some of the problems that we have faced and again i would like to tell you that it is uh, then this is my personal knowledge it is not it will not uh, you know you will not find it in a textbook only thing i can say is that you know, there are some generic principles that we have learned in metallurgy and we use that to solve some of these problems how much time Oh, it's okay so maybe i'll just take just two examples maybe i should have spent more time here so this, the first alloy is uh, the first example is uh, a structural titanium alloy this is uh, titanium 2 aluminum 2 magnesium that approximately that is the composition and as i told uh, titanium is basically uh, processed by vacuum arc melting so you have a two stage of vacuum arc melting the problem with this alloy is it contain magnesium and magnesium has a high vapor pressure so when you do it in uh, vacuum it we lose lot of magnesium so how do we take care of that so what we did was that instead of doing uh, you know what we did the first melt that we took which involved melting of sponge that we did under vacuum so there you are able to you know whatever magnesium has to go out it goes out along with titanium tetrachloride because the sponge itself contains titanium tetrachloride so all those uh, muck are removed and in the secondary melt uh, we we did it under argon atmosphere so but argon atmosphere generally it is not used in uh, in in that arc melting unit but we innovated that because we had some experience at lab scale where we were able to take very small scale melts in argon atmosphere successfully so we did that in argon atmosphere so it did two things first of all it reduced the you know loss of magnesium number one and the melt was much quieter i mean there was not much turbulence of course we required the expertise of midhani you know they had some skilled melters so we used that so a difficult alloy a very simple alloy compositionally but difficult to process was successfully melted and then of course you know subsequent processing to make it to sheets and then evaluation in cold rolling also we had lot of problem because uh, when we went from hot rolling to cold rolling the sheets started cracking again the experience at lab we we knew that uh, there must be some oxygen enrichment at, at the surface so we Uh, you know we help them with the pickling operation you have to remove certain amount of material in cold rolling i mean it is across the scale that applies i mean we when if you if you you know process a small amount of material or you process a large amount of material you have to remove the scale about maybe 0.3 mm from both the sides so once you do that it's very easy but if you don't know then the whole process becomes very difficult and these are very big sheets expensive sheets the cost of sheet today will be about Seven to eight thousand rupees per kg. So in one go, you are probably, you know, one lakh worth of material you are, you are wasting. So you have to be taking this mm, care. So this is like what one practical, you know, uh, you know, practical one some practical solutions to solving some of the problems that we face at an industry. Professor, can you wrap it up? Uh, one, time is up. Yeah, maybe two more minutes. I'll just finish it. I, I had many more examples, but I don't think I have time for showing that. But this is something that. you know we have been doing recently so from titanium to tungsten that itself for me was a very big shift because i was experiencing titanium but suddenly i was put into tungsten because of lack of manpower and maybe the organization required it so with a little bit of hesitation but okay coming to the problem the problem is this uh this tungsten heavy uh, heavy alloy rods are basically used as anti tack penetrators so you have a very long rod which is accelerated uh, Uh, through 1 lakh g compared to 10 g that is what you experience in air rod right so here you have the acceleration 1 lakh g and the speed that you attain is 1.5 km per second 
So when you do that, when you have such acceleration, if you do some modeling work, you will find that there are stresses that are induced at the rear end of the penetrator. And these stresses go to about 1600 to 1700 MPa, which means the material has to have good impact properties. And uh, you know, the impact properties of the order of 100 joule per centimeter square, these are unnotched samples. And uh, so this is the requirement. But if you, you know, if you see some of the distributions in impact toughness, you can see the average impact is about 150 joule. But the lower, lower most bound, you know, you have 30, you have, you know, 40. This is something that is not allowed. And what, what are we supposed to do? If you look at the mm, distribution on the right hand side, the green one is that is something that we start with, you know, the lower average properties and scatter with very low values. What we would like to do is to go to the red one. The average property needs to be improved and even the tail end has to go to the right side. And once you do that, then you have to reduce this variability in property. And that is when you, you are going to make that distribution even uh, finer. So these are of course, uh, this can be solved with, you know, metallurgical, uh, you know, approach plus uh, some of the quality control issues that exist in industry. So uh, yes, consistency is of in property is something that we are still working with and, you know, as uh, Dr. Dasar Ram said that we have we have opened DISCOE, so we are also involving IIT BHU, so they will be into the thick of things. Uh, the primary goal will be to improve the impact properties, reduce the scatter, so that is one effort. Uh, we are outsourcing to um, IIT BHU and maybe some other institutes also if they feel that they can contribute in this area. Also, can you the control? positive is it involves, uh, you know, uh, not only just technical, but it is also, you know, managerial, you know, lot, there, there's a lot of networking because three organizations work together. My, uh, our, uh, my lab, DMRL, ARD, and then HEPF. So we all three work together in tandem. Professor, can and you come to the conclusion? Yeah. So, and finally, just uh, based on the properties that we get, uh, we were able to convince the user that we can do some firing trials. So we have done some firing trials recently, and ultimately, the proof of the pudding lies in its taste. You'll agree, right? So the penetrators that we made, despite of the scatter, Despite the scatter they were there, we were able to do some successful fire trials. The job does not end, we have to continue, we have to, you know, the goal as I showed in that distribution plot, the average properties have to go up, the scatter has to come down. And of course, uh, you know, the, the effort is continuous uh, because we also need to develop uh, materials with better properties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, please wait. For the moment, uh, that will be provided. So, the next presentation is from Altair, who are the silver sponsor of this uh, conference. It's better for me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, myself, Ramesha, representing Alter. I am heading academic initiatives here. Uh, we work on computation science, number one. Number two, we also work on data science, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and analytics. And number three, the high performance computing. So, how it is integrated, how we can uh, elevate the research activities in India is the, my talk. Now the basic case is how the products being evolved in India. So you might have seen the Bajaj Chetak scooter, okay. Over a period of time, the demand or the expectation from the, the customer community has been uh, influencing the product change, okay. So earlier it's more about a mechanical product where we talk about the CC rating, okay. You can go easily with your family. That was a selling point for the customer. But now the selling point has been changed towards most towards the IT uh, enabled uh, uh, what you call facilities in the vehicle okay uh, it has bluetooth connection it is electric vehicle you can charge in your uh, what you call home so these are the kind of uh, what you call unique selling points uh, which the product uh, has gained the attention in the customer community so the intent of putting this progress slide is uh, we provide uh, uh, technology for the smart product development. It's no more a mechanical product. It's more than that into it. Okay. Now, for the research community, I have this particular slide. 
where the funding is happening, where the funds are coming. It's all about the mega trends. So you can see the electrification drive happening throughout uh, India worldwide. People are moving away from the fossil fuel to the electric vehicles. The mobility industry is changing a lot. Uh, there are a lot of adoptions of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the product and the product life cycle. Uh, we are more moving towards data driven because Corona has made us to think in different way. Okay, we can work from home and uh, the data is always can be spent on clusters. Semiconductor technology is moving a lot. We have to compete with China. A lot of investment is coming in this particular segment. People are moving towards cloud. So as the headlines goes on, these are the areas where the investment is happening and I request the researchers to focus more on these areas which can have a lot of attention uh, in the, the commercial space and the job opportunities. Uh, in India, we have offices in five regional, um, five places, uh, Bangalore being the headquarters where a lot of development happens. Uh, there are 800 employees working in Bangalore. Uh, we have office in Hyderabad, Chennai, uh, Pune and Delhi. And all the defense lab is our customer. Uh, in PDED, uh, our scientist Padugur Raju could be able to add value to the missile uh, component and we are proud contributors to the Indian defense system as well. So we generate around 572 million dollars. Uh, worldwide we have 3,000 employees. Uh, we cater to around 13,000 customers and we have presence in more than 27 countries to name a few. Now what is impacting is, I mean what we provide, uh, what you called, uh, uh, sorry. So what we actually provide solutions. We provide solutions to R2 manufacturing, autonomous driving, ADAS, big data, cloud computing, digital twin, e-mobility. So if you are working on any of these research data, we have a scope to use all the products and all the solutions. And of course we have light weighting, machine learning, performance improvement, manufacturing analytics, mechatronics, smart product development, 5G, all these areas we have a simulation platform so that you can reduce the cost of product prototyping and other stuff. Now. What is the name of the product? Hyperworks is the kind of product which helps you to simulate sudden physics. Okay, it could be structural, it could be thermal, it could be the CFD, computation fluid dynamics, multi-body by dynamic simulations, okay, uh, fracture mechanics, those kind of stuff. So all these stuff comes under one particular platform for uh, Alter Hyperworks, which also includes programming for embedded programming. Uh, you can do uh, high frequency electromagnetic analysis. Uh, antenna design, antenna placement, radar cross section, EMI, EMC, uh, defense problems like bomb blast, TNT blast, explosions. So all these in this particular platform. At the same time, data science comes under the rapid miner platform. Uh, it's an end-to-end -end platform. It, it can support a lot of databases. You can apply a lot of machine learning algorithms. You can create dashboards. And with the help of IoT, you can, you can make any product smarter with a feedback mechanism completely. That means you have a physical system, you have a digital system and you can connect each other with a digital thing. So this is where Alter operates. So, so Alter 1 is a one platform which has facilitate to all this. Now given this basic introduction about uh, the Alter and Alter products, in what way we can help the academic community. So we have Alter University portal which is also called learn.alter.com through which any research scholar should be able to get uh, almost a commercial grade license free of cost uh, from this particular portal. Because of advent in the technologies, uh, completely scalable learning ecosystem is available. Any number of students can participate uh, in the instructor led training directly. They can inst interact with the experts. Okay? Uh, if they don't have time to attend those dedicated inst instructor led training, they can also take e-learning courses. They can learn the tools and technology themselves. If any of the researchers working on any of these discipline and if there is a scope to use all the technology, we can provide the commercial grade license to the student itself directly so that he can use those product as part of research activities and also we are going to help uh, the research student with the, the domain knowledge by the experts and many more. So just to give an example of uh, how our technology can be used, this is an example on the EV side itself. Uh, if we are developing an electric vehicle, we talk about lot of load cases. Okay, we have two homologation agencies are there in India, could be ARI or ICAT. They come up with the uh, load cases information. 
to make uh, uh, the vehicle worthy to sell in India, for example. So, in such a domain, we talk about the strength, stiffness, fatigue, NVH, noise, vibration, hardness, stick and rattle, safety, uh, ride and handling, external aerodynamics, okay, uh, under hood flow, okay, water wading problems. These are all lower cases. You typically go for physical testing and can be greatly reduced by using your simulation platforms. At the same time, uh, because of advent in uh, technological changes moving away from fossil fuel, if you are working on electric vehicles, you can always use our low frequency electromagnetic analysis like flux for designing motors. You can do the motor control for the various targets. Okay, You have Arduino boards, Raspberry Pi, Texas instrument chips. There are various chips are there for which you can do the embedded programming. And of course, once you have a lot of sensors, you can design and you collect the data, you can take the data into, into cloud and you can create a digital view out of it. Okay. And not the but not at least, we also work on ADAS, okay, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infra communication, and whatever the meta model that you have, it has to be working on the edge itself, okay, uh, in the vehicle itself, because based on the state of charge or state of discharge of the battery itself, we can predict the the mileage coming out of the particular vehicle. So, those are the things uh, giving an example on the electric vehicle, uh, we have a scope to use all the technology. Ramesh ji, two minutes. Yes, sir, done. Okay. So, for what uh, tool name, I mean, what are the tools that you can download directly from Altair? Okay. These are the uh, tools available for different uh, specifications like industrial design, concept design. Manufacturing simulation, model based development, you can do math modeling with our solutions, multidisciplinary optimization where Alter is the pioneer, composite simulation, advanced modeling and relation, various analysis, okay, uh, where you you can you can download unlimited license directly from Alter. Any point of time if you have any queries, feel free to contact me. I am ready to help you. We are going to provide the academic lab license to any institution across India. At the same time, we also understand the problems related to the industry. We have come up with a uh, uh, kind of ecosystem where the students who are having knowledge or industry experience, I mean, sorry, the practical experience of using our knowledge, we try to connect with our industry so that they can get plays in those industries. So, we offer virtual internship. We have also have regular internship so that the students can make use of our facilities. Uh, and their, their profiles are shared to these ex industries, okay, who are regularly uh, taking uh, uh, qualified human resources from alter industry outreach. So, this is a kind of a small contribution which actually helping our industry, the ecosystem in terms of getting the skill manpower. And of course, uh, we drive through project based learning. We do not enforce a student to pick up a project, rather we facilitate whichever the project is working, how to do through the simulation platform is what the agenda is all about. At the same time, the job posting is also done in this particular portal, which, which the students can walk, which can see and he can apply to those particular customers and thereby he can get the industry connect. And last but not least, we also work on startups, the incubator connect. So, if any institution has an incubator, the problems will be very different in nature. We try to connect to the ecosystem directly. So, when you are developing, uh, uh, we connect with lot of industry experts who do not have not, nothing related to alter as such. It could be on funding, it could be something on IP production. So, on those areas, we try to bring in experts so that it can create a value system for the, the startup revolution which is happening in over India. Okay. So, these are the small introduction which alter is doing. So, for any of these uh, outcomes, it is a one stop solution, it is called alter one. And feel free to connect me at any point of time to extend the support of alter. Thank you so much. Thank you for an interesting talk. Please wait for the moment. Thank you, Ramesh ji. Now I would uh, like to request our next speaker is uh, Sashi Sai Raman, CEO of MTAP Technology Center Private Limited to give her talk. Uh, good afternoon. So, uh, when I was invited and I was asked to speak about this, uh, I basically I represent two companies. I represent MTAV Engineers, which is in the manufacturing space and uh, is quite well known amongst the IITs for its uh, education and skill development products. And I also represent MTAP Technology, which is in the area of digital transformation and is a pure services company. 
So I decided that my talk would be more focused on MTAP Technology Center, which is offering this, right? Now, if you were to look at what we see, what we have been seeing uh, from a services perspective as we are in digital transformation is that uh, a lot, and this focus is coming more from MSMEs. We do not talk about the larger companies or the conglomerates. We're more focused on the MSMEs and the startups as to what is happening in that space. Across board, what we suddenly find is a huge demand in the cloud-based either uh, MRP and ERP uh, solutions. There is a huge demand for talent. People are scrambling around and saying that I'm looking for talent, I want to recruit, but I'm not able to find people. They hire and they keep firing because there's an issue of cultural mismatch, training mismatch, so on, so, so on and so forth. The other thing that we are noticing is students or are, students are job seekers are extensively looking for opportunities. They have the skill set and that is also a huge gap. Right? These are the challenges. And one of the things that we've been doing for the past three years is internships, project-based learning, and the third is partnering with industry to ensure that people who do this are connected to the industry and therein, you know, the gap, the bridge, bridging the gap between the industry and academia. And how do we do this, right? For this, I would have to introduce uh, what MTAP Technology Center does, uh, and then you'd probably understand. First and foremost, uh, we offer our services through three brands, which is CNC Train, Skillon 365, and Abhyas. And uh, between our brands, we actually represent about 400 odd MSMEs, which continuously recruit through our community program. This is something that I would like uh, all of you to know. CNC Train, the, fir the first brand CNC Train is primarily for institutions or training centers where it focuses on smart manufacturing training solutions. Skillon 365 is a US-based company and as well as in India. And what we do is it offers for cloud-based and open-source ERP solutions through Zoho and uh, Odoo. And Abhyas is basically a community. We operate it as a community. It is a talent management platform which purely offers project-based learning and internships. Now, the commonality between all these three is that the focus is we run very strong job role-based, entry-level job role-based evaluations entry-level job role based onboarding courses. This is our basically our success mantra. Because we are able to run these two very effectively, we solve the problem there, right? I'm not going to go much here uh, because that's not what it is. I'm going to focus more on the community, which is the internship, right? And these are life metrics. In I would say in two years, right? Uh, this is, by the way, we are not funded. We are completely bootstrapped. We do not do advertising. All that you see, the numbers are purely through word of mouth because we are a community. We've got, uh, we run weekly internships, which is across about 100 and, we have 150 plus job roles. And on a weekly basis today, we have 5,000 plus applicants, but till, till date, we've got 100,000 plus applicants in our internship program. We've successfully have got 5,000 plus who've interned with us and more than 80% have completed, I mean, have been placed, uh, certified as the live data, 4,876, right? Uh, this is just saying this. Now, the most important uh, thing is it started in India. Right now, we've gone global. We've got more than uh, 11 countries from which students apply. And very, very interesting mix, uh, not just students, we also have uh, job seekers and returnships, right? What is our internship? Our internship is actually an entry-level job role. So it is not some uh, training program. It is not uh, some something where you learn. It's actually where you execute, one executes a project, a live project in a customer. So it's remote, it's online, you're provided with a tool access. And after that, if you would like to become an entrepreneur or you want placement support, any of it happens, right? This is a, some of the profile of our interns from which countries, primarily, as I said, is Asia and Africa. And now we've got an increasing percentage coming from US, Europe, and Middle East. Uh, we initially, when we started, we had a lot of students apply. Now freshers, job seekers, I would say freshers and people with experience have started. So 
more than 70% of people who come to us are today job seekers who in turn and they in turn for a period of 3 to 6 months before they do this uh we've got graduates most of them who apply are graduates and then we also have post graduate we also have school students this is a very very interesting phenomena we have school students who are in their 11th and 12th uh they intern with us uh, they intern with us on very interesting job roles and they go about it right uh you can see these are some of the institutions from which uh, we were we've got applicants and i university iit and i think iit bhu is also featuring in it we've got quite a few people who come from iit bhu as well now what happens after our internships is you can continue your education you can get into placement which were job roles for a 400 plus companies and companies keep coming to us because they have now realized that if it's an internship from our from the abhyas community and somebody has completed in a job role they are absolutely confident that the person has the skill and it's he's done the relevant and we build the necessary electronic portfolio to showcase this as well many of uh, our interns also have become solopreneurs so what we see in the new age is that uh, we find that people do not want to shift they don't want to relocate they want to stay in their own homes they want to work virtually so they also start out as solo solopreneurs and then there are entrepreneurs so in a way we've also the community has emerged as a unknowingly as an incubation center where it has incubated at least 15 entrepreneurs who've gone about to start their own companies and do this so this is what i wanted to present um we are only in this last week we started outreaching to institutions as well as companies to say that hey you can start partnering with us because we've so far been a pure b2c a rather a b2 student or b2 applicant direct applicant we've never uh, been partnering with institutions so now we've started doing the outreach necessary outreach saying that if institutions are looking to partner these are some of the things that we can do work with the institution ensure that in a way help them uh, not just uh do the internship with us they can we can set it up as uh, an instance or a facility here where they can also enable other organizations to come and offer uh, such internships and therein establish a successful incubation center right uh so this is these are some of the features but i'm going to actually stay within limit and cut this short sir so thank you so much So if anybody has some questions I would like to take it otherwise uh yes so is still couple of minutes left so if anyone in the audience has any question they can ask sure what are what are some of the rules that you provide in your internship and how can you plan for so this is the that's why i put up this slide right uh, first and foremost our internships are fully free uh you get this the intern gets paid intern does not pay so uh it's an open competing this thing and you can go ahead all the job roles will be available there it's a cross smart manufacturing and digital transformation uh institutions when they want to partner is slightly different and we do find that sometimes students want to skip the evaluation in which case we clearly tell them that this is the way to do this but the third option is not something that we necessarily recommend okay okay Thank you ma'am thank, thank you, you for so an interesting talk Yeah so the next presenter is uh, Mr Shankar Subramanianam from uh, Caterpillar So his talk will be need for industry academia collaboration with case studies Okay good afternoon uh I would like to uh, share some of the uh, uh industry requirements actually this industry academia collaboration is not new it has been there for uh, quite some time and uh, but uh, it has been going on and uh, it has been very effective in many of the aspects but uh, in this presentation what i am trying to uh, say is there are many areas that are unaddressed and where uh, the academia can support the industries and uh, the uh it can be a mutual benefit to both industry and academia so that is what i am going to uh, say in this so this is what uh, quickly i am going to uh, cover in this uh, presentation so uh if you see uh, when it comes to industry 
मोर देन एनी हाई लेवल काइंड ऑफ आर एंड डी और रिसर्च वी आर एक्चुअली एक्सपेक्टिंग सपोर्ट एट द बेसिक लेवल ओके सो वी हैव मेजर ओ ई एम्स टीयर वन एंड टीयर टू विच रिक्वायर सपोर्ट फॉर रेगुलर टेस्टिंग ऑफ देयर कॉम्पोनेंट्स एंड वैलिडेटिंग देयर प्रोडक्ट्स एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट सो that is where uh, we need uh, the academic uh, support okay uh one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, requirement uh, from industry is that we need uh, academia to support some of our suppliers because we have a lot of issues still with the basic uh, for example a foundry not being able to produce components defect free we have quality issues we have uh, uh, line issues forging uh, companies not being able to produce quality products so these are areas where the uh, suppliers at tier 1 tier 2 level they need some kind of basic uh, training uh, where they can uh, produce components without any quality issues rejections rework and things like that so um, uh these are some of the challenges we face in real that we uh, see on a day to day basis and uh, in fact what as oems we can do see i come from caterpillar there are many oems uh, in this country so as oem we can face facilitate i mean facilitate uh, some of these kind of collaborations uh, with academia so that uh, the expertise is delivered to the uh, suppliers uh, one example typical uh, that i can uh, tell you is uh, support uh, for simulations we have uh, um, uh, some of our uh, suppliers who are not able to pay for pay heavy fee for the licenses of some of the uh, uh, simulation software because they are uh, tier 2 typically tier 3 uh, suppliers they are typically small time suppliers who are not willing to uh, spend so much of money in spending uh, for licenses of big uh, software so here in where the academia can pitch in and uh, support so that any simulation support will actually reduce the number of iterations when we go for a new product development with some of our suppliers okay so here are possible collaboration areas where uh, our uh, uh, academia can support so uh, having uh, said this see this has to be a sustainable model okay so it cannot be that uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, economy of scale in terms of uh, monetary uh, things uh, both have to be at a advantage so how we can do that is that academia can actually create um, kind of a, um, a separate cell Uh, wherein uh, the uh, supplier can actually it should be something like a one point of one window of approach or one point of contact where uh, the industry can uh, actually approach and get the things done um, one biggest advantage from this model is that the academia can also charge the suppliers for the services they provide and this can actually be used for uh, uh the annual maintenance contract of your very costly equipments like uh, microscope uh, tm and things like that they require huge amount of money for annual maintenance contract and for calibration so this kind of support can actually generate money so it is something like a self sustaining model where the money can be uh, used for these kind of purposes and you need not have to depend depend on some grant or some uh, Uh, some other uh, source of income so uh, typical uh, testing facility required by industry is like uh, fractography when you have a failure analysis measurement of uh, residual stresses fatigue testing see the these are some of the routine requirements sought by industry where uh, uh, academia can actually try to uh, see where uh, they can support and uh, even tier 2 and tier 3 uh, industries they need support for some of the basic testing like optical emission spectroscopy 
and uh, checking um, some cast iron material, uh, basic mechanical tests like uh, tensile impact. And uh, these are things which are actually very easy support can be provided by any of uh, the institute because the basic structure is available here. The only thing is the affordability of these tier 2 and tier 3 companies. They cannot afford a lab and they are willing to uh, take support from anybody who is willing to uh, so provide this kind of uh, support at an affordable cost. So for them, cost is a major uh, constraint and uh, if these things can be matched, then it is a really good uh, um, idea to collaborate. And uh, uh, I also know that the sophisticated instruments that are available for, uh, available at the institutes are for students. So, uh, what we can think of is that a small amount of time, maybe 20 and depending on the number of students available and number of students using that particular equipment, uh, 25 to 50 percent of the equipment availability can be made available to the industry and the rest of the time the students can use it for their research purpose and, and uh, other uh, research activities. Okay. So, uh, I am going to share a couple of potential uh, areas where uh, industry can actually directly collaborate. So, uh, as far as uh, uh, one example is that uh, welding. So, we need a lot, of, as a company, Caterpillar, we need a lot of uh, support in terms of weld testing, welder qualification and uh, uh, qualifying the process and uh, things like that. But one concern here is that Whoever is supporting, even from academia, we require a minimum level of certification wherein the person should be certified by, certified for AWS, certified welding inspector kind of uh, uh, standards and also uh, who is good in uh, uh, studying and interpreting and implementing uh, standards like ASME and uh, things like that. So, what I am trying to say here is the person should be strong in fundamentals and uh, should be able to understand the industry problems so that he can be a, he or she can be of uh, help uh, to the industry okay um, again um, another potential area is uh, non destructive testing where we have very uh, i mean we always uh, uh, have shortage of uh, uh, human power specifically in areas like uh, ultrasonic testing uh, phased array, ultrasonic testing and things like that. Again, here we need only qualified people even if they come from academia uh, to support industries. Qualification in terms of ASNT certification, level 3, uh, he is a, a person who can actually write the procedure. Level 2 and level 1 are the people who actually work at the shop floor level. Okay, and under the supervision of a level 3 person. So, students and faculty, they can um, kind of explore possibility of getting certified in these kind of uh, certifications which can, they can actually really participate in industry support. Okay, um, one more uh, uh, suggestion for academia is that you have so many laboratories, uh, testing and uh, validation laboratories. Going for ISO 17025 certification is actually a good idea. In fact, in Caterpillar, we have a minimum requirement that any uh, certifying or uh, testing laboratory providing support to our uh, company Caterpillar should be certified for ISO 17025. Okay, so these are some of the areas where, uh, in, um, I mean, uh, uh, academia or the institutions can explore because these are uh, things that will actually enhance your uh, testing capabilities, testing competencies and uh, the people competency and things like that so that you can actually uh, involve in industry problems and support. Okay. So, I will conclude with one case study where uh, we have an upcoming project. So, this is a manufacturing conference. Okay. So, this is actually a uh, confluence or um, um, this is actually a project where we need the support of manufacturing uh, technology people as well as metallurgy people. So, we have a project where we are planning to uh, go for some cryogenic uh, machining of uh, 
transmission spindles hobbing uh, and uh, we it is uh, absolutely new new for us so initial talks are on we are actually planning to start uh, start this project uh, probably in january or uh, february and uh, we also want to study not only the machining aspect of going for a cryogenic uh, machining but also the metallurgical impact short term and long term uh, what are the irreversible kind of things that will happen what are the reversible kind of things will happen impact on properties mechanical properties like impact and things like that so this kind of uh, projects are uh, pretty useful for students who are probably at the masters level this is a typical project where a master student can come stay with us for maybe 6 uh, months or so and work on this kind of project and it is something like a win win kind of a situation for both for us and for the student okay so probably uh, i will conclude here uh, so uh, any questions probably uh, we can discuss during lunch thank you thank you for a very nice talk i just wait for it. Okay so the next uh, speaker is Kaushal himself uh, from Tata Steel R&D and he is going to uh, give a talk on uh, resistance spot welding so, so you have uh, 15 minutes uh, Kaushal thank you for the nice in introduction and first of all i would like to thank everyone uh, for being present here and thanks to the organizing team for inviting me so the topic of my presentation is resistance spot welding for different generations of advanced high strength steels especially targeted for automotive sector and what are the needs and opportunities for innovation so the flow of my presentation will be like that first of all i will introduce what is resistance spot welding uh, then i will introduce different advanced high strength steels typically used for automotive applications some well established facts with regard to rsw of different ahss and then challenges and opportunities research gaps for different advanced high strength steels and coated steels and eventually i will introduce the white space for r&d for uh, different uh, students and faculty members may work on those areas so first of all introduction to resistance spot welding so what are the salient features of it it is based on the classic h equal to i square rt joule's law of heating and there are different resistance basically five types of resistance first is between the resistance offered by the top and lower electrodes then the resistance uh, between the electrodes and the lower and upper uh, sheets then the resistance between these sheet metal interfaces so all these resistance contribute to the heating during the process and compared to the conventional welding process like uh, gmw it does not require any filler material and the electrodes are typically made of copper and its alloys for high conductivity so different welding parameters are welding current welding time and the electrode force and there uh, with the advent of advanced high strength steel multiple welding has become popular so what are the advantages and industrial applications of rsw so first of all it has the advantage of having 150 years of knowledge base and experience as i mentioned earlier there is no need of filler material it is an extremely efficient method so less than 1 second of welding time is needed to fabricate a joint so the processing window for a large range of conventional grades of automotive materials are established and because of these uh, advantages a typical four wheeler has more than 5000 spot welds in a vehicle so some of the inherent challenges as you can see this is the cross section of a spot weld this is the upper sheet this is the lower sheet and in a narrow region you see lot of thermal variation uh, so the center is fusion zone where the actual melting between the two sheet happens and on either side of it uh, there are different heat affected zones upper critical heat affected zones lower critical heat affected zones su subcritical and intercritical so there is a large gradient in microstructure secondly there is an indentation at the seat uh, which leads with to stress concentration and can lead to fatigue crack initiation both uh, at the seat Uh, upward and downward and also at the sheet metal interface then 
it is not suitable for sheet th uh, of higher thickness particularly greater than 3 mm and dissimilar mat uh, material joining is always a challenge when there is a possibility of intermetallic formation and in case of coated product uh, there are challenges of removal of coating and formation of liquid metal embrittlement so what are uh, ahss ahss are the advanced high strength steel and this is the typical banana curve uh, sh plotting on the y axis is elongation and on the x axis is strength so we know in general strength and ductilities are uh, inversely proportional if we develop grades with higher strength ductility tends to go down uh, but for some steels especially second generation of advanced high strength steel containing austenitic stainless steel or twip steel we can simultaneously get a uh, favorable strength as well as ductility due to twinning induced plasticity or transformation induced plasticity but then these generations of ahss second generation are not amenable to welding or suffers from cold cracking so there are developments of third generation which has which are basically multi phase steels uh, these can contain ferrite martensite retained austenite and so on so this is considered to be a great area of potential application in automotive future uh, in future so we can see this is a typical uh, distribution of uh, the materials used in a uh, particular car opel astra uh, in evolution of materials with from year so the uh, the mild steel is increasingly being replaced by advanced high strength steel and press hardened steel and hence there is a need to study and optimize the welding of these grades of steel so what are the failure modes in spot welding these are interfacial when the crack completely propagates inside the fusion zone partial interfacial when it propagates up to a certain extent inside the fusion zone and then propagates in the thickness direction and the last one is the most favorable that is pull out failure in this case we understand if the nugget diameter increases there is a increased likelihood of transitioning from interfacial to partial interfacial and eventually the desirable pull out failure mode but this is typical up to first generation of advanced high strength steel such as dual phase steel but this does not follow for the second and third generation of ahss so for uh, up to dp 600 dp 780 this you, it's fine that you get above a critical nugget diameter and you get pull out failure so coming to the third generation of advanced high strength steel you can see formation of solidification cracks in the weld zone due to segregation of elements like manganese and also there can be softening in the subcritical heat affected zone due to tempering of the martensite so these ratio that is hardening ratio and softening ratios are quite important in dictating the failure mode so uh, researchers have started to investigate the fracture toughness of these weld nugget but we know for evaluating fracture toughness you ne need standard ct samples but for such uh, 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 sample dimension is not possible with uh, this kind of thin spot welds so uh, people use miniaturized sample you prepare using fib from a specific location of interest and do cantilever kind of loading and they have found that uh, fracture toughness has a defining role on the overall failure uh, mechanism but such studies are still very limited and uh, academy uh, ac people from academia can look into these possibilities so coming to the white spaces for r&d in rsw of novel steel first in case of new product de development when industries go for new product development the sample size is often limited so in that case doing detailed welding evaluation is not a possibility because it requires lot of sam samples for establishing first weld lobe then doing tensile shear cross tension and coach pill tests in different configuration so first way is to go for integra uh, integrated computational welding engineering approach for rsw which is not much explored for different welding such as gmaw and laser welding icwe or icme kind of approach is uh, quite studied but uh, for resistance spot welding there is still dearth of literature and there have been some efforts at tata steel to adopt this kind of approach for medium magnesium steel a bit a few slides i will show and second can be the miniaturizing of the test specimens so in this direction we have not explored yet so this is again a potential area for joint exploration so as i said uh, 
to reduce the number of actual testing and experimentation uh, we we do some software simulation to at different welding parameters and only ex explore or test at limited number of parameters so how to go but these databases don't contain the exact steel that you are working on so first you need to create the database so for creating the database of any steel you you need uh, phase diagrams and phase diagrams can be estimated either through uh, some thermocal kind of software or uh, or through limited experimentation like dilatometry so that we did then again you need to determine resistivity versus temperature because it is resistance based uh, resistance heating based process so that you can get from gmat pro for a given composition and prior osnite grain size and tensile properties and sheet thickness are not a tough thing to get then you give rsw inputs and you see in the cross section how the size of the fusion zone is increasing and at 8 kilo ampere with these specific parameters you are getting the expulsion that is excess metal is flowing out so by this approach we could reduce the samples significantly and uh, one can see that there is a good matching between the simulation and experiment uh, experimental cross section in terms of fusion zone and has has thickness profile and uh, indeed the nugget size followed a good relation between uh, uh, with the experiment and uh, simulation so there is no need to go for such extensive experimentation in terms of this these are all for a new grade of medium manganese steel which was uh, developed jointly with uh, nml and uh, mishra dhatu nigam limited so we see for a particular parameter for going from 6 kilo ampere to 7 kilo ampere both strength and ductility increased which is again unconventional for uh, most of these steels so the reason being at 6 kilo ampere we were getting interdendritic uh, brittle uh, fracture cracks were propagating along the grain boundary but at 7 kilo ampere we were getting quasi cleavage fracture that is some ductility in forms of dimples were getting restored so the reason for such uh, intergranular cracking was pre existing crack you can see in the fusion zone at 6 kilo ampere along with extensive segregation of manganese and silicon so what led to combined increase in strength and ductility number one is elimination elimination of solidification crack second is some softening of fusion zone you can see the reduced hardness from 600 hv to 550 hv and reversion of austenite so at higher current we could see some re reverted austenite as confirmed by xrd and after tensile testing uh, those austenite were mostly getting transformed to martensite so we know trip effect favors both uh, an increase in strength and ductility so second white space even we know in in automotive sector increasingly we are using taylor welded blank so dissimilar joining is becoming the trend so although for such grades or such taylor welded blanks uh, tensile properties are well established there are limited studies on the fatigue so we found even for a grade like uh, interstitial free steel and hsl steel combination the failure behavior are quite different for uh, fatigue compared to tensile you can see crack getting initiated in the heat affected zone of if steel and moving perpendicularly as in contrast to the initiation of crack in the base metal for tensile so even if you are sure that crack is initiating in the base metal in tensile shear uh, you need to test it in fatigue because in vehicles will actually experience cyclic loading condition in service third white space i would say is the if determination of effect of pre strain we know that steel grades are formed prior to welding but the effect of pre strain on welding parameter is not est established for most of the uh, modern grades of steel so that leads to unexpected expulsion during welding because the sheet thickness has reduced and also the dis in additional dislocations have introduced which raises the resistivity of the sheet metal i am i am putting uh, just few more white spaces for research in the area of rsw for fourth is simulating the paint baking you, we know after once the vehicle is prepared those are painted and then they are subjected to typical paint baking cycle of 170 degrees celsius for 20 minutes those small cycles of heat treatment can have an influence on the diffusion of especially carbon and there are reports of change in mechanical properties due to paint baking for certain grades of spot welds so detailed studies should be conducted 
Fifth is weldability assessment of tailor welded joints involving novel AHSS. Second, two minutes. Ha, sure, I will wrap up. And the and next is multi stack RSW welding. So earlier we used to see only two sheets getting joint in vehicles. Now we are seeing three or even four sheets are being joined by resistance spot welding. And they not only have different compositions and microstructure, they can also have different thicknesses. So in such case, it is very important to get a complete penetration as well as good mechanical properties. And last is the uh, gap in my opinion is the crash crash worthiness assessment. Even the standards of spot welds only suggest about testing in tensile shear or cross tension configuration at uh, quasi static loading condition like uh, uh, point, uh, 10 power minus 3 per second or 5 mm per minute cross head velocity. But under actual crash situation strain rates are much much higher. So uh, with increasing safety standards, there is a need to evaluate high strain rate behavior of spot welded joints. So the take home message from my presentations are two. Despite being a 150 year old process, RSW has many opportunities for research and innovation. Primarily due to two drivers. The first one is the increased safety thrust by automakers and second is the light weighting as driven by the advent of new advanced high strength steels. Thank you. As a token of appreciation, we would like to present a moment to Okay, we probably have the final speaker for the day, Dr. Kuldeep Panwa from uh, Infosys Noida. He is going to uh, give a talk on application and challenges of FEA in product life cycle. Over to you, Dr. Kuldeep. Thank you, sir. A very warm welcome to everyone and thank you for staying back till the last day, last talk of this session. So myself, Kuldeep Pawar, and I'll be representing Turbo Machinery Propul Propulsion Group of Infosys. And I'll be talking about the challenges and applications in the field of FEA in a product life cycle. So this is us at Infosys. Uh, we are a group of around more than 800 experienced engineers who are working into reducing weight, noise, emission, development cycles and cost while improving the fuel efficiency. Uh, we work into the industries which are supporting the gas turbines such as GE, Siemens, aero engines again for GE, steam turbines for fossil, nuclear, solar and thermal applications, wind turbines and we can say like renewable uh, energy sources. So I'll just skip this one. Okay. So this is our scope, which goes with the product life cycle. So it starts as an MI engineer, and or we can say an FE engineer. It starts with an NPI or a product development, and then there are design modification during the project executions. Then there are test cases and correlations. With, it, with this, we get the online stress monitoring during the operations. For example, in turbines now we have this during the operation of a turbine. We also tend to record the stresses at that point so that the controller has all these informations. At any state of point of any component or a heavy machinery, we are able to uh, estimate the life consumption, then calculate the life type assessment and residual life. Also, if there is any kind of failure during the, uh, the running of a machine, we conduct the RCA, that is root cause analysis, and then how the design life can be extended. So broadly, we can categorize this into rotor dynamics and vibration analysis that you see in, the, in this last. This the left bottom box. So it is in a nutshell we can say everything that is moving in a steam turbine and whatever is supporting it like bearing pedestal and foundations. Then we have RCA 
that is conducted through let's say 3D FEA assessment and complex repair solutions. I'll be sharing one or two challenges or we can say the case studies for this session. Then lifetime assessment of an ongoing machine. If we have provided some kind of a repair solution, then we predict the lifetime assessment. And then there is a start startup optimization. Now this is quite new with with uh, with the emergence of renewable sources. Most of the steam turbines, the the operators or we can say the uh, the owners they don't want to run their steam turbine for the base loads. So we have flexible operations. The machine who, which was like designed for a base load category now they want to run it at a different starts and the start timings are also different so how to optimize that particular so that if a machine which was designed for 30 hours of 30 uh, years for operation uh, with a certain number of cold starts now if the company wants to change it so it will have an impact on its life but that can be done so in a nutshell we can say uh, in last 50 years there has been few key factors that have been making this product development a challenge and in today's era the out of out of the box idea uh, being first in the market and offering apart from the core function of a component these all factors are making and giving more pressures on the analyst and on the engineers to make this product development cycle more quicker and to make a product that is kind of an innovative. Now where structural integrity and MI and FEA comes into it. So basically structural integ integrity is uh, we can say like the calculation of stresses on the application of load on any structure and the tool and the method the approximation method which we use through computers let's say one of them is finite element analysis or finite element method FEM so that is FEA so I'll not go, I'll not go into because we all are from mechanical engineering background and we know very well what is what basically is FEA but as a definition I can say this this is the most beautiful thing that happened with the combination of mathematicians and engineers because engineers are responsible for lots and lots of codes for this FEA and the mathematicians they have done a tremendous job in finding out solutions and finding out how a solution can be more accurate and more and more accurate and how it can be solved so basically we know in nature there are a lot every every problem that is in the nature it is in it it is in form of a differential equation and computers don't like don't like dif differential equations because they can solve discrete uh, problems or finite problems so how we make these uh, differential equation turn into a discrete or a solvable problem by computer so it all started from glerkin in in russia where he took few uh, trial functions two or three and he, he approximated and we are good in, in, in engineering we, we work with the approximate solutions uh, any any factor that is of an error of 10 to the power 3 or we say in 2 or 3 decimal point depending upon where we are going to use it so we, we work with the approximation and with the better computational power today now we are working with more than 100,000 of such simple functions so we can say that FEA is now work now using very very simple functions solving them and then uh, in, in a way in a nutshell it, that differential equation that was not possible for a computer to solve is being solved so I'll skip this we already have talked about this so there because there are loads and the nature of loads are different they are cyclic they are, they are non-linear they are uh, they, there are dynamic and transient loads so thermal loads so the effects are there in the machine component and whenever there are the effects then uh, there will be certain fa failures I'll skip this one for you okay so now once the FEA is done being being and uh, being a simulation software so we know we know that whenever we provide an input to an to FEA that there has to be some output so that there has to be a proper testing and validation before going into into the the solution or uh, the the ultimate answer so you can see that uh, in in a picture around, uh, below there we have we have 
A that is that is something that ha that has been broken from the bumper of a CUV, and in in picture C you see in picture B you see something that has been made similar in the lab for the testing, and in C you see the same simulation that happened in the FEA. So testings can be done in laboratories. They can be done in real life situ uh, by creating real, real life situations and then validations uh, and uh, of course by FEA and then we do the validations. A similar like for the same uh, problem that I was showing that we did for Mahindra uh, and Mahindra last uh, earlier. So we see the two, uh, two strain uh, curves uh, at the bottom. The, uh, the top one is CAE that is from the software and then there is a real test that was conducted uh, at the laboratories. So with the such kind of testing and validation we can predict that okay the simulation is doing good so those results can be predicted. So around in uh, uh, can you wrap it up in two minutes? Yeah sure. Okay. So I'll just go through the then challenges. So this is something which happened with the steam turbine you see picture one a control stage loss of crack and when we took, uh, took it out, there was complete disaster, a fatigue damage. Then RCA was done, what was the cause and what could be the solution. So we saw that uh, there is no root cause, th there was no problem with the resonance, there was no problem with the stresses, they were, uh, they were, there were high stresses but they were, along, they were in, within the limits. In detail, RCA it was found that this was the earlier design of the control stage that broke and this is the new design or the concept that was given. So we, we saw that the, at, at this central pin region here there were the stresses were very high and depending upon that a new design was, concept was given with the two rows of pins which was earlier 3 to 6 and then again this model was tested we see here the frequency uh, the nodal diameter and the resonance whether the frequency is coming into the resonance area or not and then we are good to go and this machine has been running since then uh, there similarly at last i'll just share one more uh, challenge uh, in terms of a last stage turbine blade and we see in the left uh, a frequency that is within the resonance range here and even the amplitude is quite high and uh, when we modified the LP arrangement now the frequency is outside, outside this resonance band and even the amplitude has been going down. So this, 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 there are certainly these type of challenges that comes into when we work and when we do the, uh, the FE assessment and we rely on those. So I guess that will be all for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuldeep, for uh, finishing it on time. Yeah. So, as a token of appreciation, kindly accept a small moment from the organizing committee. So, I also request Silvery sponsor Mitutoyo to come on the stage for uh, taking a moment. Of Thank you so much, chairpersons. Now the session is ended.